Welcome to Think Tech on Spectrum OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Elise Anderson. And I'm Cynthia Sinclair. This week, we'll look at the 2019 U.S. Hong Kong China Forum presented by the Hong Kong Business Association of Hawaii at the Lani Akea YWCA. It featured an array of business speakers and panels examining the business climate and prospects in Hong Kong, China, and Hawaii. Everyone knows that prosperity is enhanced by trade. This has been proven over the centuries. Trade and the resulting system of globalization has driven innovation, competition, and quality, efficiency in markets, and the allocation of resources as well as global governance standards and stability. And it is obvious that how we respond to today's challenges will determine the next stage of the global, national, and local economies. As the U.S. pulls back from globalization, China is advancing. The One Belt, One Road initiative is Beijing's grand strategy. Will this great power rivalry define the 21st century? And with what effect? And how should global business navigate the resulting uncertainties? I'm here with Roger Epstein, uh, who is a lawyer, who a tax lawyer, but who has done a lot of work in China. And that's why we're talking about Belt and Road, the Belt and Road Initiative, formerly known as One Belt, One and One Road. Yes. That's changed, though, because you could not argue this is one belt and one road. This is many belts and many roads. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it girds the earth. Yeah, just about. Gurge the earth. At least the earth as far as Asia and uh, I think even some parts of Africa and uh, Europe. We are not part of that earth. Yeah, so let's talk first in the first part of our show about what, what it's doing, who's involved, how it works. The second part of our show, let's talk about uh, the American participation or not. And if not, what effect on the U.S.? You know, because this is a global initiative. Yeah. So uh, I guess it was uh, 2013, Xi Jinping decided going to do this. And actually, in my view, it followed on what he did with CCTV. CCTV was a China news network in China, and he decided, or they decided, back in the early, the aught years, uh, to make it global. And they did. They made the China News Network or something. And there are 44 stations now all over the world. Mm. And they are pumping out uh, pro China news all over the world. Yeah. Um, so they became global in terms of the information and propaganda. Um, and that, that worked. So then this follows. This is economic development all over the world. Right. You know. Right. Oh, yes. And, and uh, it, the, the, the overall picture is here's places where there isn't adequate infrastructure, either by land, autos, rail, trucking, uh, or by sea, which is the road, so uh, maritime. So the, the grand scheme of the Chinese is to uh, lend money and uh, build out the infrastructure in all these different countries so that you uh, recapture the Silk Road, the old Silk Road from China to across Europe. And uh, uh, very, very incredibly big uh, undertaking. And in my mind, very thoughtful, as I think the Chinese are in, in economic matters. To me, China it sees the United States as where they want to be. Now, things are definitely changing. And uh, the Trump administration has decided uh, what's in it for us. We need to protect ourselves. We, I think that's exactly where you don't want to be as the world changes. You want to be part of the change. Uh, uh, talking about the Belt and Road, we had a competing kind of uh, project uh, with uh, many of the leading, uh, the, the larger, more established uh, capitalist countries over there called uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Mm. Uncle Donald got us out of that. Uh, so now we don't even have, we don't have anything. And some of those players are trying to reform the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Some of them are talking to China. Certainly, uh, we're out of it. 
With these profound changes in the global economy, the world needs a new convening platform to reflect and engage the competitive positions of emerging economies to address the future of public and private partnerships and to identify solutions for cross-border issues that affect us all. In the program at Lani Akea, the Hong Kong Business Association of Hawaii brought its flagship conference back to Honolulu to address a range of topics, including economics, trade, investment, urbanization, infrastructure, retail, technology, entrepreneurship, and of course, U.S.-China relations. As you know, you saw the TV all the time about the China and U.S. trade had conflict. Yeah, so people call it trade war, but I don't want to call it a trade war, but it's a conflict. So um, back and forth, and I thought that it's put us, uh, a U.S. resident or or, or businessmen, um, it, it's just in a very odd po position. So especially like China. If you want to do trade with China, that puts yeah, it in an odd a, a position. Yeah, a lot of trade is with China, actually. Yeah. You will be surprised. may not be Hawaii, but yeah. a lot of trade. But Hawaii should be interested. Hawaii should know about these things, yes. participate at least in the conversation. Yes. So, um, and I thought that because also I am a Chinese uh, immigrant from Hong Kong, and I also, I also thought it's put us in an awkward position because of they've been fighting for the trade. So I hope that we can put in a program so everybody have a dialogue so we can talk about it and hopefully we can find a solution, you know, um, to, to, to you do this. You have a chock block program here. I mean, you have speaker after speaker. I know. You have a real, you know, this is a, a we have actually parade eight, of talent. Yeah. Eight uh, out of town speaker. Three of them are directly from Hong Kong and five of them is full from a U.S. mainland. Yeah. So, so when we do a show uh, mm -hmm. or a movie, we always ask ourselves, what is the takeaway? What takeaway do you want people to get from this program on the 20th? Yes. It's very clear that um, we have two two sides of it, morning and the afternoon. The morning side, we are focused on the U.S. and uh, China trade uh, policy and relation. So hopefully that the audience or the participant will learn and or participate in the dialogue and conversation uh, after the, the panel they uh, addressed it. And hopefully that we can find a common solution to solve at least the Hawaii and Hong Kong China problem, yeah. not necessarily the national problem, yeah. right? So we cannot control. But in the afternoon, it's a practical business advice uh, by all our uh, uh, speakers, Which is including Gerald Sumida. <laughs> I, would, I would expect nothing less. <laughs> yes. You know, from time to time, you see little points of resistance by Beijing. They say, no, you, you stay there, Hong Kong. We have our plans for Hong Kong, and you are not the masters of your destiny. We are. Um, but, but that may or may not carry, because the real momentum here is that Hong Kong was, is, and to a large extent will continue to be the gateway, business-wise, to China. Am I right? Partly. Partly. <laughs> okay. I, I, I think now what, it, what has happened, quite frankly, is that you've got direct lines to other parts of China from the outside. And that, that's not just North America, but also throughout Asia and in Europe. So Hong Kong is in an evolving situation, to put it nicely. Uh, you do have the you know, uh, uh, two systems, one country approach, which some people would deem to be eroding within Hong Kong. Uh, Singapore has looked very much as a potential counterpoint, if not uh, rival Better. to Hong yeah. Kong. Yeah. So we're in a state of, of flux. Uh, Hong Kong still is a major way in, but it's not exclusive. And as you know, right across the border, there was a, now a metropolis of Shenzhen. Previously, it was just a relatively small village. And now it's one of the largest, larger cities in Almost China. And it has and direct connections right. and with right. everywhere in the world. Yeah. That's right. And it's developing into a, a, an IT and an AI powerhouse. The forum convened a diverse group of speakers, including diplomats, officials, academics, executives, entrepreneurs, and opinion leaders from the East, Hong Kong, and the West, 
Hawaii and the mainland. The dialogue among speakers and participants was productive and stimulating. It was designed to promote understanding on important issues, to identify opportunities including trade globalization and competition, and to explore possibilities of public-private partnerships, investments, and initiatives. The discussion covered U.S.-China relations and trade, the new economy and the smart city, the One Belt, One Road initiative, the financial and capital markets, outbound investment from China, the Chinese consumer retail and e-commerce markets, and the state of innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship. In the morning, the forum helped us understand the current economic environment in the U.S.-China trade dispute and get a handle on China's economic plans, how these sea changes will affect the growth or decline of the global economy and thus our daily lives, and how we can find solutions to current and future economic and geopolitical challenges. I think what I want to do is really give you a, an idea of how grand the project is, initiative, and it is simply too big for China to embark on in terms of the uh, project. Now, uh, having said that, uh, I think I agree with the previous speaker. I think Richard made a very good comment in terms of Bell and Road and also Southeast Asia and South Asia. Uh, simply uh, said, um, this is very different from Marshall Plan of 30, 40 years ago, when US and the West and Europe were, have been, had been fully engaged in helping emerging market economies, building roads and hospitals and blah, 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 blah. Now the difference is, is really, is, is this is a pretty new initiative since 2013. And frankly, many of the projects have been approved and funded, but it's only five, six year old. So no one knows exactly what the implication is. And I just want to highlight and point out that I totally agree with Richard in terms of Bell and Road would not be successful globally, period. That's just simply too big an initiative for China to embark on. You know, China has three uh, trillion in reserves. It's gonna be burned very easily with all the project financing and funding. And also, more importantly, um, being so proximity to Southeast Asia, South Asia, I think China has a very good chance of succeeding in Southeast Asia because of proximity, in particular with uh, provinces in Central and West China, as well as uh, Hong Kong, Greater Bay Area. I think this is not a coincidence. When you look at Bell and Road Initiative that was introduced in December 2013, that the Greater Bay Area, recently introduced, actually has been in planning for many years. So I think China recognized that really the Bell and Road Initiative is a great concept, a very uh, big in terms of investment resources. And simply put that maybe China, I think the government leadership probably realized the last few years that 
to succeed in some of the sections or regions of the world in terms of BRI, Southeast Asia, South Asia would be the logical choices. And more importantly, I think it's the allocation of resources, being so proximity to the market. And some of the projects that the previous speaker mentioned reflects that. Um, I think we have talked about AIB funding. And certainly there is a, a lack of funding from ECAs, you know, export credit agencies, uh, EBRD, uh, even Japan Bank uh, for International Cooperation is also will be engaging with AIIB. And just give you a different perspective. Uh, there are currently, I think, probably close to 35 projects being approved and funded. Some are fully funded and some are partially funded in about, in terms of dollar value, less than $8 billion from AIIB. Now, of the 35 projects, only one in China less than half a billion dollars, even though China is the largest shareholder. But, but AIB actually was set up mirroring that of the World Bank, uh, ADB, as well as EBRC. So World Bank, and I'm sure Mr. Sumila knows about it, World Bank, largest shareholder is US, followed by Japan. I think each has something like 19 to 17% respectively, and all, also other countries. And, but, uh, the ADB, Japan is the largest shareholder, followed by US. So I, I guess China has been actually following the AIB model, has been following, learning from the World Bank and the ADB. So the funding aspect is very key to the success of the projects because you need commercial banks to be involved, certainly. And I know a fact that all the top 10 Chinese banks, these are not policy banks, have already set aside probably each bank in excess of $200 billion in the Bell and Road funding. And they have actually chosen Hong Kong to be the regional funding source center for all the BRI projects on behalf of China. In the afternoon, the forum covered practical information and advice about doing business in Hong Kong and China how global businesses can tap into China's most promising opportunities and cross-border foreign investments. First and foremost question is, um, where is the funding? So the Chinese government has actually set up the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, to provide the initial funding for a lot of the projects. Uh, an initial capital of 100 billion US dollars has been put uh, aside uh, for the initial uh, uh, funding for a lot of the projects. And for the AIIB, uh, there are now more than 80 approved members with more than 60 founding members. A lot of these founding members are actually countries from the West, like the UK, France, Germany, and so on. So um, you can see that um, uh, the initiative has actually got a lot of the support from the um, international uh, country. For TDC, uh, we try to um, promote the Belgian road business opportunities, uh, starting from the uh, easiest uh, uh, projects that is close to Hong Kong and also under our influence. So that's why we set priorities and uh, we help companies to explore the business opportunities uh, at the nearest uh, markets in Southeast Asia first. So Southeast Asia is the top priority among all the regions uh, in the uh, Belt and Road um, uh, routings. Uh, we have already brought a lot of the business delegations or even organized exhibitions in many Southeast, a Southeast Asian countries, including Indonesia, Malaysia, and so on, uh, and even Vietnam. Uh, so that uh, we can capture those uh, business opportunities there. Um, essentially, um, Hong Kong is a trading hub, so we try to uh, promote our trading relationship with all these countries in the Southeast Asian uh, countries. This shows, in effect, the goal of China to reach through Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and the northern part of the continent. And it's already been summarized, these are some of the scope of the geographic and economic perspectives for the Belt and Road. 62% of the world's population, 23 trillion combined GDP of all countries involved. And in the five years since Belt and Road was first initiated, uh, we have, as of last year, about 117 countries that in one way or another are participating. 
Just by way of comparison, if you look at the other regional trade uh, arrangements that exist, including TPP in its original form, and then TPP X minus the United States in its current form, one belt, one road with China and without China, RCEP and the FTAP, uh, you'll see that one belt, one road is clearly the most extensive and largest in terms of numbers and coverage. The forum also helped us learn how Hong Kong is a technology hub for entrepreneurs and startups who want to tap into Chinese capital and financial markets. And it provided great opportunities for networking and deal making among participants, speakers, and sponsors. I think today everyone comes over here to look for business opportunities. And that's why um, we try to promote the uh, Belt and Road Initiative because we think that you can all share the business opportunities arising from the initiative. Well, basically, as Jay mentioned, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, doesn't consist of only one belt or one row. Uh, the belt actually means the um, Silk Road Economic Belt, and the uh, row uh, is a little bit misleading because it actually means the 21st century maritime Silk Road. It's the uh, maritime uh, routing instead of a, a land uh, routing. Um, so um, it actually consists of a lot of um, routings, but then um, I think for the time being we don't need to bother about uh, the exact location or the exact, exact uh, pathways of the uh, Belt and Road. We just look for the uh, business opportunities arising from the Belt and Road Initiative. As Jay mentioned, uh, it is a very important initiative because it is a major globalization project initiated by the Chinese government. But the intention of the Chinese government is for everyone to participate so that everyone can share the opportunities arising from this initiative. Because China alone cannot take up all the projects. It's such a huge project, it may last for a few generations. So it's not just for our generation to enjoy the benefits, but it's for our children, even for our grandchildren to uh, continue the um, uh, effort in order to um, bring it to fruition and to have the um, final uh, result of this uh, globalization process. Want to know more about the Hong Kong Business Association of Hawaii? Check it out at hkbah.org or facebook.com slash hkbah.
And now, let's check out our ThinkTech schedule of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows live on the internet from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. And some people listen to them all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show, or if you want to replay or share any of our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. For our audio stream, go to thinktechhawaii.com slash audio, and we post all our shows as podcasts on iTunes. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links. Or better yet, sign up on our email list and get our daily email advisories. ThinkTech has a high-tech green screen studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to see it or be part of our live audience, or if you want to participate in our shows, contact shows at thinktechhawaii.com. If you want to pose a question or make a comment during a show, call 808-374-2014 and help us raise public awareness on ThinkTech. Go ahead, give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at ThinkTechHI. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives in these islands and in this country. We want to stay in touch with you and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. Let's think together. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Hey, Cynthia, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it just like Cynthia does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our ThinkTech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii. And of course, the ongoing search for innovation wherever we can find it. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important ThinkTech episode. I'm Elise Anderson. And I'm Cynthia Sinclair. Aloha, everyone.